Amen. Amen. Well, today we are continuing in our sermon series from the letter to the Philippian people. If you have your Bible or Bible app, please go ahead and turn to page 1164. I'm sorry, if you have your Bible or Bible app, turn to Philippians chapter 1, verses 12. If you're using one of the Bibles located underneath the seat in front of you, turn to 1164. And I want to welcome our two other campuses who are joining us. We want to welcome our Parker campus today, and we want to welcome our online campus today. We are so glad that you guys are there with us. If you're sitting in Alumni Hall right now in Parker, you can jump up if you don't have a Bible. Well, you can jump up any other way, reason if you'd like, but you can jump up and go grab a Bible in the back of the room and it's seated right there. It's seated right there at the table in the middle. Grab a Bible and go back to your seat. And if you're joining us online and you do not have a Bible that you can read or understand easily, please let one of our online hosts know. We would love to mail a Bible directly to you free of charge. Uh, we want you to have it. And if you are located in Hawaii, I promise you, I will personally deliver that Bible to you. And for all those in Parker and in Sweetwater, if you don't have a Bible that you can read, that you have at your house, that you can understand easily, we want to invite you to take one of our Bibles home with you. We truly believe if we read God's Word and apply God's Word, He will bring life change to us all. If any early follower of Jesus was considered a superstar, it would have been the Apostle Paul. We're reading this letter that Paul wrote to the Philippian church while he was sitting in house arrest in Rome. And if any early Christian was considered that mega superstar, that mega church pastor, it was the Apostle Paul. Uh, he had the origin story of being a former persecutor of Christians. He hunted them down. He hated them. He chased them out of town uh, to town. He was a Pharisee following in the same footsteps as the Pharisees that nailed Jesus or that led the Roman government to nail Jesus to the cross. But then Paul had that life-changing encounter with Jesus. He met the resurrected Jesus on that road to Damascus. A few days later, he received the Holy Spirit. He became a missionary traveling from town to town, instead of chasing followers of Jesus out of town and persecuting them, he began to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. He, he taught them about hope for the forgiveness of sins, hope for a relationship with the true God. He planted churches and he raised up leaders and wherever Paul went, you can read about this in the New Testament, read in Acts, wherever he went, People gave their lives to Jesus. People experienced life change. They stopped placing hope in false idols. Uh, they stopped pl placing hope in false gods, in sorcery, in witchcraft, even in Caesar. And they began to live lives devoted to God. It was a change from the inside out. And it was radical. It was unheard of. People had never before seen anything like this. And many citizens of Rome and the Roman government, remember, that was responsible for crucifying Jesus, did not like what they saw. They didn't like what people were doing. They didn't like this radical life change that they were experiencing because they had many gods and many idols. So Paul was arrested he was placed under house arrest and he was chained to a wall inside that house for two years. Now, I have never been arrested. Uh, it's confession, right? I probably should have been arrested a couple times, but I've never been arrested. I don't know what that feels like to be arrested. And I love the fact that we have many men and women that attend Calvary and even on staff at Calvary who are part of Calvary that knows what it's like to sit in a jail cell. They know what it's like to be arrested and they know what it's like to experience the grace of God in their lives that God has changed their lives. Now, again, I don't know what it's like to be confined to a certain amount of space. I don't know what it's like to be assigned a certain spot to sleep in or to have somebody to tell me when it's time to wake up or go to sleep or what to wear or what to eat. Actually, that sounds a lot like marriage. 
just kidding. I mean, for some of you, not for me. That sounds like marriage to some of you. And when Paul was arrested, there were some people that were really overjoyed that he had been arrested. There were people that hated Paul. There were people that hated the message that he taught. And they didn't think the arrest was enough. They thought, in fact, man, maybe we can cause more pain for him while he's under house arrest. We need to make it harder on him. So they actually devised a plan. And we're going to read about that in Philippians 1.12. Just outside the quarters where Paul was confined, day after day, these people went up and down the street preaching the gospel. They told people about Jesus. They told people that Jesus was the only way to receive forgiveness for sins, that Jesus died on the cross, that he rose from the dead, that one day he's going to return. Isn't that silly? They thought they were going to make life difficult for Paul by sharing the gospel because the gospel is what put Paul in jail in the first place. Paul was able to hear them from within his place of confinement. He heard them really kind of mocking his ministry. And so as he wrote this letter to the Philippian church, Paul addressed the fact that other people were trying to make it difficult for him. So let's begin reading Philippians chapter 1, beginning in verse 12 on page 1164. Paul writes, I want you to know, brothers... That what has happened to me, which was his arrest, has actually served to advance the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. And the former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. Yes, I will rejoice. Now, scholars tell us that this is one of the first times, if not the first time, that Paul was actually arrested for sharing his faith. No no doubt that there were some early followers of Jesus that were a little bit discouraged that their superstar preacher was now arrested for telling people the good news. They most likely did not know where it was going to end up now that Rome had made an official stance and had placed Paul under arrest. This imprisonment caused pain for Paul. It caused pain for those early followers of Jesus. Now, let me ask you a question. Is there something that you've experienced recently in life that has caused pain for you? Maybe something's caused pain for you or your spouse, maybe your family. Uh, Maybe it's been just the whole pandemic. Maybe it's the COVID vaccine, getting a shot in your arm and feeling like a bruise for days. Uh, Maybe you've actually experienced financial loss. See, as much as we like to think that followers of Jesus don't experience pain, as much as we would like to believe that, it's not true. Followers of Jesus who have surrendered their lives to Jesus will continue to experience pain. We will continue to experience all the effects of sin. We'll continue to experience miscarriages, diagnoses of cancer, of disease. We'll continue to experience job loss and heartache and breakup in relationships. We'll continue to experience uh, marriages falling apart and children, children not living the way that we hope that they would live. Some people still have to deal with childhood trauma. Other people have to deal with a a marriage on the brink of disaster. Some people just have to deal with being rejected and not accepted. So how do followers of Jesus manage their pain? How do we deal with life when things really truly hurt us? When When it disturbs our soul, when it bothers us, when it unsettles us? 
What type of pain management does a follower of Jesus have in their life? How do we walk through those difficult seasons of pain knowing that some of you are experiencing them now and knowing that some of us will experience them in the future? Well, we see from this example how Paul managed his pain. First, we have to understand that even for followers of Jesus, pain will make me bitter or better. Pain that we experience in our lives will make me bitter or better. So what do I mean by that? Well, we've all met people who, have the, who demonstrate the chronic symptoms of bitterness in their life. I love them. God loves them. But they sure make it hard to be around. I mean, they're bitter about everything that's happened to them in life. They're almost always a victim. They're always blaming other people for problems in their lives. Uh, the moon is too bright. The sun isn't bright enough, right? They complain about their work and their family and their church, and they always seem to speak negatively about other people. They're simply just not pleasant to be around. Have you ever met somebody like that? You ever met somebody that just seemed to be a chronically negative, bitter person? So raise your hand if you know somebody like that. Uh, raise your hand if you wish you didn't know somebody like that. Yeah, it just makes it hard to be around them. They seem to really kind of suck the joy out of living for Jesus. Now, here's what I want you to know. I, I recognize and understand that many of you probably suffer from bitterness yourself. Right? You've experienced some type of trauma. You've experienced some type of negative pain in your life. And instead of becoming better, you became bitter. Well, I want you to know God loves you. God cares for you. And I'm sorry if I hurt your feelings when I'm making a joke about bitterness or bitter people. I do want you to know that God can change you. And God can restore hope. And God can restore joy to your life again. If you invite him to. So ask him throughout the course of this message, just ask him, God, turn my heart away from being a bitter person and help me to become better because God can help you become a better person. Now, Paul had been arrested for telling people about Jesus, but the arrest did not make him bitter. In fact, it made him better. His confidence in the Lord grew and other people's confidence in the Lord grew. He could have complained he could have said, God, what in the world is going on? I'm telling people about Jesus. This is what you told me to do. And now I'm handcuffed, whatever chains were, I'm chained inside a house for the next two years. I don't want to do this anymore. It's too hard. I, I want to get out and I want to live. Thanks a lot. But instead, his pain made him better. In fact, it gave him so much confidence, he was able to say in Philippians 1.12, I want you to know, brothers, that the things that have happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel. So that has become known, so that has become evident to the whole palace guard, the imperial guard, and to everybody else that my chains are in Christ. When he talked about how his pain, actually this imprisonment served to advance the gospel, he was making it very clear to the early church that this setback, that this, this bump in the road, this thing that he didn't expect and nobody else expected, this discouragement, this two-year imprisonment would not cause him to take a step backwards in his faith. He said the pain of imprisonment actually helped him to carry out the mission of seeing life change happen the good news of Jesus. And now it's like the whole imperial guard had become, at least heard the message of Jesus while he's chained up. I love it. He's chained. I can imagine seeing him chained to the walls of the house, smiling. And he's telling those people that are guarding him, hey, you know what I'm in here for? I'm in here for Jesus. Jesus changed my life. Let me tell you about what happened on the road to Damascus. Let me tell you about what happened when this guy came and prayed over me and these scales, like, like these things like scales fell from my eyes. Let me tell you, I used to be a persecutor and I used to be a, 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 a Jewish terrorist and now I'm a follower of Jesus and he can forgive your sins. 
I mean, I imagine that's what was taking place inside Paul's confinement. His arrest, his pain, actually kept him on point with the mission. If you're not intentional about pain when you experience it, if you're not into managing the pain when you experience it as it happens in your life, and if you're not intentional about becoming better, by default, you and I will become bitter. We have got to be determined that when we walk through any type of hardship that we experience in our lives, we've got to be determined that we're, it's not going to discourage us from being a follower of Jesus. And you're not going to allow this devastating event to occur to make you a bitter person. And you have to understand, you've got to be sure that your attitude determines your outcome. Your attitude, that, that attitude that you carry into that devastating moment, that attitude that you bring into your pain, it's going to determine whether or not you become bitter or better. Now, I'm not talking about your attitude is going to take away your diagnosis. Okay, I'm not suggesting that having a positive mental attitude is going to cleanse you of cancer. Uh, that's not what I'm suggesting at all. What I'm suggesting is it matters more. Your character shaping matters more than actually being cleansed by the disease. Your character, who, the, who God is shaping you into, that person you are becoming. The attitude you have when facing pain and discouragement in your life can determine whether or not you're going to become a better person through that pain. Now, those people that were outside the walls of the, the house where Paul was arrested, they wanted to make life miserable for Paul. Uh, they were in the streets and they were mocking the good news of Jesus. Up and down the streets, they were yelling that people needed to trust in Jesus for the forgiveness of sins. They thought that by doing so, they would make life more difficult for Paul. So how was Paul able to say that their motives in preaching did not matter? In verse 18, Paul said, look, it doesn't matter why they're talking about Jesus. All that matters is they're talking about Jesus. All that matters is they're telling other people about Jesus because God is able to take what people use even in a sense of mocking and redeem it. He's able to redeem the speech and the message of the people that were hoping to share enough of the gospel to cause more pain for Paul. Maybe they thought the Roman guards would actually tighten up the chains a little bit more or give them less rations of food or whatever it was. But they had in their mind that they were going to inflict pain on Paul by telling people about Jesus. And Paul said to the Philippians, look, it doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is the mission. I can experience this pain. I can experience the, the mocking. The only thing that matters is that people are hearing about Jesus through this pain. He also wrote a little bit later on to, to the Philippians in chapter 4, verse 8. And he said, finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there's anything of virtue, if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. If there was anybody in this moment, in this letter, that was able to focus on the negative, it would have been Paul. Hey, man, I'm having a hard time here. The guards are tightening my wrist. It really hurts, right? The food is terrible. Man, he said, look, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there's anything of virtue, if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on that. That's an attitude that we need to have as we walk through difficult times. That's an attitude that we have to have when we experience the terrible news that we sometimes experience in this life. And I wish that, I wish that none of us experienced the death of a loved one. I wish that none of us experienced a, a, a diagnosis. But we are not free from the impact of sin on this planet. So we've got to have a positive attitude. 
by focusing on the things that are true and good and lovely and pure. Anybody without Jesus can focus on the negative, right? Anybody without Jesus, let them focus on negative. Let them have a bad day, right? Let them focus on negative outcome. But if you're a follower of Jesus, you have hope. You have a savior who's going to walk with you through that. You've been forgiven for your sin. You have a right relationship with God. That means we can walk through the pain and focus on those things that are pure, good, just, and lovely. And as you focus on those things, it will become clear that your pain can be a doorway to life change for others. Your pain can be a doorway of life change for others. Now, I am not... I am not belittling pain that you've experienced in life. We all have different types of pain and different, different understanding of pain and difficulties that we face in our lives. And I, I'm not, I don't want you to hear me belittling, belittling that and saying it doesn't matter. It does matter. You have a God that loves you, that you can pour your heart out to, that God collects all the tears that you cry. He, he loves you passionately and deeply. And he cares about your, your hurt and your pain. Jesus said, come to me, all of you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest for your soul. God cares about your pain. So I don't want you to think that I'm saying this in a way that is belittling. But Paul said the pain that he was experiencing there in prison was actually helping him tell other people about Jesus. It, it gave him an opportunity that he wouldn't have had before to tell the imperial guard and to all the rest that his chains were in Christ. For Paul, it was simple. He chose to use his pain as leverage, as a doorway, as a way of connecting with other people and share the mission, share the hope, the life-changing good news of Jesus with other people. See, if he had never been arrested, in Paul's mind, he wouldn't have the, the audience. But now he had guards that had to be there in the house with him. They had to listen to what he was saying, whether they wanted to or not. And he told them about Jesus. When we shut down Calvary last year twice, we had to choose between wringing our hands in fear and saying, oh no, what do we do? And, and laying around in a fetal position, which we wouldn't have done, it's never really an option, or we pivoted to an online service. And that's what we did. We had to pivot. And what did God do? We saw the most baptisms last year of any other year in the history of Calvary. And it's because we didn't focus on the problem. We focused on the mission. And our mission at Calvary is to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus. And that means whether we experience good or whether we experience bad, we use whatever God gives to us as leverage, as a doorway to share hope with a hurting world, to share hope to those without Jesus. And that's what we did last year. We used our pain and our discomfort as a doorway to life change. Now, when I talk about this pain and I talk about this hurt, I want you to know my wife and I, we're walking through that right now. I shared a little bit last week. I'm gonna share a little, or two weeks ago, I'll share a little bit more. On Easter Sunday, our third daughter was diagnosed with type one diabetes. We have four daughters and three of them now have, three of them now, had been diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. Through no fault of their own, their immune system decided to attack the insulin-producing cells inside the pancreas and destroy them. So for the rest of their lives, my kids, unless there's a cure for diabetes, my kids are going to have to have insulin every single day. They're always gonna have to watch the amount of carbs that they eat, and they gotta see how much insulin they have to have in their bodies for the rest of their lives. For me as a dad, it's not a death sentence, but if it sure feels like a bad sentence. Right? I, I feel that weight for my children. If there was ever, any ever disease that I could take from, from anybody, it would be this and just have it for myself. So when I talk to you about going through hard times, I know what that feels like. And our hope 
continues to be in Jesus. We believe that our pain can be used to share the good news with a whole different audience. We, we can share the good news with parents who have kids with type 1 diabetes more than you ever could because we know now what they are going through. We know what their experience is like. So we're continuing to pray and trying to figure it out. We're not yet precisely sure what our ministry to T1D parents and kids is going to look like, but we know that God has given us common ground with thousands of parents who need to hear about the great physician, who need to hear that Jesus can bring healing and hope to their soul and the forgiveness of sins. We believe that our pain is a doorway to bring life change to other people that we have not yet met. And so is yours. The pain that you've had from your past, the pain that you have in the present, the pain that you'll experience in the future, it is there as a doorway that God wants to use to connect with other people to share the life-changing hope. And that sharing that life-changing hope of Jesus may be as simple as inviting them out to a cup of, for a cup of coffee. It may be inviting them to a church worship service and going to eat with them afterwards. It might be just telling them about the work that God's doing in your heart and your life. It might be just being a friend and showing love to somebody. I firmly believe and the power and the promise of Romans 8, 28. The Apostle Paul said, we, we, the Apostle Paul said, we know that God causes everything to work together for good to those who love God and to those who are called according to his purpose. Everything means everything. Everything always means everything. Here's what I mean. Your cancer diagnosis is a doorway to share the life-changing message of Jesus with your uh, medical team. Your child's crazy behavior in school is a doorway to share the life-changing message of Jesus with the teachers and with the administration. Every bit of pain that God allows us as followers of Jesus in our, in our life, every bit of pain that we experience can be redeemed. God can use it for the good. God can use it to bring hope. Do you live your life believing that? And if you do, start telling other people about pain. Don't live under the mindset that we are a Barbie church, where every, a Ken and Barbie church, where everything has to be perfect. But we're a we're a people who have experienced brokenness and we're a people who have experienced pain. And there's a world out there in Havasu and in Parker that has experienced hurt and pain as well. And they need to hear about how God has carried you through it. So will you allow God to use your story if you've got a story that you want to share with us, I invite you, reach out, grab one of those Connect cards and write it down. You know, from time to time, we're always sharing video testimonies and stories about how God has worked in people's lives. So let me encourage you, write that out if you're willing to share about your pain in life and how God has brought you through it. So let's together live out Romans 8, 28. Let's together live out Paul's attitude in Philippians 1, 12. And let's pray together. Father, thank you. Thank you that when we walk through hope, or when we walk through difficult times, hope is not abandoned. When we walk through pain, when we walk through uh, uh, heartache, we are not abandoned but our hope continues to be in you. And Lord, we thank you that you use the Apostle Paul's life. Uh, you use this pain, this imprisonment as an opportunity to let the Imperial Guard know and to everybody else that there's, his chains were in Christ. So God, use our pain as well. Open up our eyes, help us to see how we can connect with other people and share hope with them. 
Father, we love you. We thank you for the life-changing message of Jesus. We invite you to continue to work in our hearts. Help us to become the men and women you've called us to be. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.